As the Allies tightened their noose around the neck of the Third Reich, the Nazis cranked up their war machine to 11. Hitler and his cronies pulled out all the stops and threw all of Germany's resources into emergency projects and inventions. In this video, we check out the last ditch Nazi war efforts that came too late to save them. First up, we have the Volkssturm, an emergency reserve formation of fighters pulled from the civilian population. The Nazi party had enforced conscription since before the war, but by October 1944, all fit men aged from 18 to 45, not in protected occupations, had already been conscripted. To bolster the army in preparation for the oncoming Soviet tsunami, Conscription was expanded to include men from 16 to 60, and those who had previously been designated as medically unfit. Hitler's goal was to get the Volkssturm to 6 million members and replace training equipment and experience with pure fanaticism. The Volkssturm never reached 6 million members and its supply situation was dire. Most units didn't have uniforms and some weren't even armed. Despite this, the Nazi elite made the Volkssturm out to be a heroic partisan organization of German patriots. The old men of the Volkssturm found this hilarious, saying, Why is the Volkssturm Germany's most precious resource? Because its members have silver in their hair, gold in their mouths, and lead in their bones. Some Volkssturm units were made up of mostly Great War veterans and fought well. The vast majority, however, were more of a liability than a capability. Even Hitler wasn't impressed, saying, Volkssturm emergency and reserve units have been little fighting value when left to themselves and can be quickly destroyed. By 1944, the Battle of the Atlantic had completely turned against Germany. Devastatingly high U-boat losses meant that stockpiles of torpedoes were going unused, but the Kriegsmarine had a solution. They bolted two G7E torpedoes together and replaced the warhead of the uppermost one with a hollow space for a pilot. Now they had a torpedo driven by another torpedo piloted by a man. It was called the Nager and was supposed to be a multi-use weapon only needing to have a new bottom torpedo fitted before being sent out again. The problem was that 80% of the time the torpedo didn't detach completely, dragging the whole craft and pilot along until it exploded. Hopped up on DIX, tablets chock full of painkillers and stimulants, the pilot could at least go out on a high. Shockingly, the first time they were deployed was a fiasco. 30 were sent to attack Allied ships in the Italian port of Anzio on the night of April 20th, 1944. 13 capsized as soon as they were put in water, and three more simply disappeared once they had been launched. The remaining 14 carried out the attack but didn't inflict any damage. This suicidal watercraft was also used against Allied ships in Normandy and a few other scattered attacks around the French and Belgian coast. These attacks managed to sink a cruiser, a destroyer, and three minesweepers. Nearly all the Nagers had been lost too, and the Kriegsmarine overhauled the design, deciding they were more trouble than they were worth. The Third Reich was constantly pounded from the air in its last year of existence. Hitler blamed the Luftwaffe and ordered Göring to sort it out. He started the Emergency Fighter Program, an initiative designed to develop a new kind of fighter. The Luftwaffe had noticed the jet-powered ME-262 outperformed Allied aircraft, but was very difficult to maintain, especially with supply shortages. Göring needed a fighter with the performance of an ME-262, the armament of a Spitfire, and the controls of a glider, as that was the only way of training new pilots. He also needed a plane that could be mass-produced and was disposable when it stopped working. Göring was a large man who was probably used to having his cake and eating it too, but his designers just didn't have the supplies to fit the emergency fighter program specifications. The best they could do was the Heinkel HE-162. The HE-162 was a jet-powered fighter first deployed in February 1945. It had numerous problems from rapid production, but handled well and could reach speeds over 750 kilometers per hour. 
120 HE-162s were delivered to squadrons and several of these managed to shoot down Allied fighters. The novel design might have made it more of an impact on the air war, but it came too late. Only five months after the HE-162's first deployment, the war in Europe was over. With German war industry collapsing in the last year of the Third Reich, it's a wonder that any weapons found their way into the hands of the Volkssturm. Far from the beautifully machined Karabiner 98 or the battle-tested MP40 was the rush job Gustloff Volkssturmgewehr. When the Volkssturm was formed in October 1944, it was immediately clear they had a critical weapon shortage. German factories simply couldn't pump out complex and well-designed infantry weapons quick enough. To solve this, Nazi High Command initiated the Primitive Weapons Program. Their goal was design a rifle that could be mass-produced with the bare minimum of machine work, ideally with stamped parts. Several bolt-action designs were tried out, known as the VG-1, VG-2 and VG-5, but they were pretty unsuccessful. The Gustloff design, however, was different. Its firing mechanism was based on a scaled-up pistol and could fire on full auto. That about sums up its advantages. In terms of disadvantages, the rifle was highly inaccurate because the sights were fixed and non-adjustable. It had no pistol grip and sometimes fell apart due to poor construction. For the unarmed Volkssturm, it was better than nothing, though not by much. And by the end of the war, 10,000 Gustloff Volkssturmgewehr had been made. Even if Germany had managed to produce enough planes to threaten the Allied air domination of Europe, they still had one big problem airfields. In the last months of the war in Europe, the Allies had bombed nearly all the Luftwaffe's airfields to rubble. While one solution to this was jet-powered planes that could take off from a short landing strip, the more sensible option was, of course, rockets. That's right, the German solution to a lack of runways was to build a manned rocket that took off vertically. Designated the Bakem BA-349 Natter, this cartoonish aircraft packed 24 more rockets in its nose. This armament was meant to act as an explosive shotgun and annihilate Allied bombers. Luckily, the designers had spared a thought for the pilot, who was likely to be a teenage Hitler Youth member with zero flying experience. The Natter was fitted with an autopilot that would guide the rocket toward a bomber group. When it got close, the pilot took manual control and fired the rockets. The Natter would then have seconds of fuel left to get out of fighter escort range before the pilot parachuted back to base. As far as we know, only one manned flight took place. It lasted 55 seconds and the Natter averaged a speed of over 800 kilometers per hour before violently crashing, killing the pilot. The 22-year-old volunteer Lothar Zieber was the first man to ever take off vertically under pure rocket power. The next man would be Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space. The Gustloff Volkssturmgewehr wasn't the only German emergency infantry weapon that made its way into the Volkssturm units. Neither was it the most unreliable. That dubious honor goes to the MP3008. The MP3008, also known as the Volksmaschinenpistole or People's Submachine Gun, was a ripoff of the British Sten submachine gun. Aside from a vertical magazine and extremely poor production quality, the weapon was a Sten. This meant it suffered from the same issues the Sten did. The worst of these was that if it was knocked, dropped or banged against something, it could go off, and it wouldn't stop firing until the 30 round magazine was emptied. The Germans had a clever fix for this problem. Their MP3008 was made entirely from stamped recycled material. Quality control was virtually non-existent so if it accidentally went off, there was a high likelihood that the weapon would jam before too many rounds were wasted. In combat, the combination of crude design and minimal Volkssturm training gave the MP3008 a bad reputation, but it wasn't necessarily a complete liability. The MP3008 was manufactured on military industrial assembly lines, but was so simple that small workshops could copy it. During the final few months of the war, workshops and factories around Germany made thousands of MP3008 for the Volkssturm. Many of these bore the mark of their workshops, featuring different stocks, pistol grips, or being fed by captured enemy ammunition. The last German project doesn't fit the same pattern as the others. Far from being a slapdash invention pulled out of the bag months before the war's end, this project had been in the works for years, but only came to fruition at the end of the war. 
The world's first true submarine, the Electroboot was a diesel electric attack submarine designed to operate fully submerged. It had a massive battery bank that gave it days of silent running time as well as a snorkel to run the engines while submerged. The hull was built for speed and maneuverability underwater, unlike the Kriegsmarine's other U-boats, which were built for surface running. Those of you who saw our video on the war's best submarines will know the Electroboot wasn't included and for good reason. It never came close to mass production. The world's first true submarine was such a complex piece of machinery that shipyards struggled to get their work up to scratch. Two were completed and deployed however, but neither managed to sink an allied ship. While the Electroboot wasn't much use to Germany in the final years of the war, it was a different story for the Allies. Immediately realizing that the Electroboot was the future of submarine design, they stole as many as they could. Britain, France, the US, and the Soviets all managed to grab an Electroboot and use them to build a new generation of submarines. These were the submarines that patrolled the next era of warfare, the Cold War. That was seven of Germany's best and craziest last ditch weapons they hoped would turn the war. But what do you think? Would you have volunteered to fly an experimental rocket plane? How do you think the Germans felt using a copied British gun? Do you think a fleet of Electro Boots could have turned the tide in the Atlantic? Let us know all this and more in the comment section below. And just to catch you guys before you click off to the next suggested video, if you guys are looking for another, even more high quality history channel, where we take a look at all the different badasses from all eras of history, you're going to love our new channel called The Braved. That link is in the description below if you want to check it out. If you're more into the musical side of things, make sure you check out our Relax Shack music channel, where we take some of the music posted there and use it in the background of the videos here. And if you want to further support us and get access to a behind the scenes discord and some exclusive videos, check out our Patreon. And if you just want to join us on our wider community, check us out on Instagram, Facebook, and discord. Anyways, guys, as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.